I did a shoot with Buster Posey, uh, and we had like 30 minutes with him. I remember I switched from, you know, 4K 30 or whatever it was to 1080 slow-mo. And it was just black. And I was like, you know, he's, he's got like three minutes at this point. I was like, what is going on? Cinema Therapy Podcast with Sam and Mitch. Welcome to the Cinema Therapy Podcast by Inland Film Co. I'm Mitch Williams. This is episode 11. In this week's installment, we sit down with special guest cinematographer Zach Trinka. Who am I kidding? We recorded this like six or seven months ago, and we have been major losers, and we should have put this out a long time ago. So, in this week's installment, we talk about how much time Sam's dropped our Sony FS7, the time Zach broke his camera while paintballing, and almost didn't get it back in time for the Winter Olympics, Zach's camera wasn't ready for Buster Posey, and how Zach carts his gear around New York City. We also discuss our trip to Patagonia, Argentina, which also happened a long, long, long time ago and is well overdue. Enjoy. Um, I was working with uh, a a producer and a director for years working on commercial documentary stuff. We were uh, commercial construction documentaries and we had a, um, um, a team of a couple people, uh, a few a seven S twos and, um, we'd hire a drone operator every once in a while. Um, and when I was trying to, I wanted to be able to have my own camera to one, add to the mix because we kept running into situations where we were renting other people's cameras because we needed one more but also i had my own projects i was working on on the side i needed a camera and i just had a dslr that was 1080 i didn't have i I wanted to be able to shoot in 4k so i in my b and h cart i had rigged out an a7s2 with all the things that i was going to need to keep up with what we were currently doing, including like a zoom recorder to be able to run XLRs. I wanted to be able to, I, I hate lav mics. Um, I wanted to be able mm-hmm. to run a boom mic with a, a shotgun overhead or whatever. Yeah. And I, I started to think, well, this is okay, cool. So I will have, I'll be at the same level. We'll be doing the same thing, the same cameras. I'll, we need to take one more. We've got to be able to take a, a step up here if i want to be able to work on bigger budgets or 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 be attractive to to more than just the person i'm working with right now or or like if we want to make this easier on ourselves why not make it easier on ourselves so i looked into bigger camera systems wanted to maybe an ursa mini the the 4.6k hadn't come out yet um the fs7 or a c300 like i was looking at all these cameras ended up going with the FS7 because we wanted to be able to plug XLRs in. We wanted a little more slow motion. We wanted to be able to put it on our shoulder. We like all these different things, mm-hmm. but it was a risk where we, Mitch and I have built our entire business on already having a camera, already having laptops, already having uh, our Adobe subscriptions. We just like jumped in. Okay. We have the gear. Let's just go for it. But, mm-hmm. um, I could have just gotten a, another A7S too, and lived with it, and then eventually wished I would have gotten the bigger camera. I wished we would have started off. But or you could have uh, gotten the Ursa Mini, which uh, was sold out or or well, or it was it was back just ordered. It was back ordered, but everybody knows that that Black Magic has some problems. Right? They're always going to have At problems with production. Uh, it had just been released, so people were getting orders, but it was like a limited quantity. So if I was going to click buy on B&H, I knew it may be six months. It might be a year. I might not get the camera for two years. Was the FS7 the one you bought in, had bought in Seattle? And Yes. Ferris? I wanted to buy an FS7, but B&H was sold out. And they said they were back ordered for a long time. I called around to a couple of different camera shops. Um nobody locally sells them but there was one camera shop in seattle glazers or yeah glazers glazers however you say it one 
they had one available. The guy went into the back room and said, yeah, I think we have one. We always like to keep one in stock. They mostly do still photo, high end still photo stuff, but they kept one Sony camera in stock. He's like, I think this is the FS7. So I bought it and I had a friend of mine pick it up, pick it up for me who lives over there. A friend of a uh, <laughs> mutual friend of Mitch and I pick it up for me. Yeah. But, um, to the point of <laughs> wanting the black magic, like the stars align. Cause you know, we, we could have been hashtagging black magic and we never, never would never have met Zach right. I would have been like, oh, stay away from those yeah, guys. Exactly. <laughs> it's true. The stars align. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I love, I love the, the FS seven so much. I continue to tell Sam that I wouldn't want any other, camera at least to be like our core camera for the yeah. for the at least starting the business i yeah. want an alexa mini or an lf but <laughs> but you've made the joke that uh maybe the you you were looking at the black magic cameras and you said and you said i don't know if this camera would be able to take the beating we've given the sony and i've 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 flown off a cliff on a motorcycle say, yeah. with that camera in my backpack. Yep. I uh, I have dropped, and this is these are all my stories. I have dropped the camera straight down onto the tile in the middle of a children's hospital, and the camera was fine. <laughs> the lens was fine. Uh, no scratches on the camera or the or the lens, but the tile floor was dented. Yep. I mean that thing well, has didn't, been didn't, through the ringer. Didn't one of you like watch it fall off the? I did. Mitch watched it happen in slow motion. Sam I set, set it, it down, down on, on a, a cushion yeah. on a on I feel a like I baby my camera now, and I don't baby my camera at all. But <laughs> after hearing your guys' stories, I feel like I baby my well, episode. And it's mostly just Mitch watching things happen to the camera and not having zero <laughs> trust in well, in his DP. Sam, Sam will just set it places that I'm like, why are you setting it there? Like, I don't... I, it's not that I... The cushion was an awful choice, but I'm getting better. A lot of getting smarter. Some of these places, though, I'm still like somebody's gonna walk by and elbow that thing. Like, I want it in the center of a table. I don't want it on the edge. I'm starting to get smarter. I, uh, I learned early on. I so that Canon GL2 that I got. Yeah. That uh, I was shooting paintball with. Uh, you know, I used to. I I had a Porta Brace cover on the outside of it, so that when it would get shot by paintballs, obviously you could just wipe it off, whatever, but it would get, it would get shot in the lens all the time. And I broke a few, I broke a few filters like filming, but one time I was, we were down at a field and I had it on a tripod. And if you've ever been inside of a paintball field, there's, there's like netting that is, it's like pretty heavy duty netting around the field. And it happened to be really windy. And I walked, I don't know why I walked away from the camera for two seconds and I turned back around and it's like face down, you know, had the wind had pushed the netting, which had pushed the tripod and just landed like oh. face down. The camera was separated from the tripod. So I go over and I pick it up and there is literally a like fist size hole in the bottom of the camera. Like it just ripped the, the, the whole mount tripod oh, quick oh release gosh. off and you could just see into like all of the electronics oh. and everything and uh but the camera was fine like it still worked perfectly fine so i had to i taped up the bottom of it and uh shot the rest of the event with this you know hole in the bottom of my camera that's amazing and i think i ordered i ordered a new bottom plate for it and like it was fine that thing was i'm telling you that thing was a tank i that i shot on that amazing in uh uh in college and that was the camera that we we used yeah. Uh, yeah. at at yep. telect yeah as well mm -hmm. and one of my first little short films in college it was i, I you know did little random stuff in high school obviously but in college the one that justin and i did on yeah. t it's an awful like it. You know, I'm still pretty stoked on it because we were working with just a single camera and a, and <laughs> and just what. Anyways, yeah, we shot on that. So I that we had the isn't the isn't there the XD1 as well the Canon 
Yeah, it's uh, a XL one. XL one. XL one. All I yeah, know is XL. all these camera models. I'm I'm jealous of you guys talking about them because they yeah the Canon XL one ex- ex- as well. Um, mm-hmm. They had we had a couple of those at our church when I was in middle school, going into high school, and they wouldn't. The tech guy wouldn't let me touch the cameras, <laughs> and I was so bummed. Uh, so hearing you guys talk about these cameras, I'm getting real jealous. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, this was pre uh, DSLR revolution. So yeah, the XL yeah. one, the GL two, we shot on as well. Anyways, we had we had that yeah. XL one in here for in the studio. Those are yeah, buddies a buddy, a a buddy of ours uh, has one and left it on a tripod in here as a decoration. The the relic, the relic. It was wonderful. I wish I still had it. It uh, there was a, I was filming paintball and there was like a monsoon, and it was pouring rain. And I brought it back in after shooting one match. And I remember the screen like just went blue and like oh. started freaking out. I mean, this was after three solid years of abuse and um, screen went blue and it was it was done. But at this point, the DSLR revolution was like happening. And so I I think I I think I, I got, I traded, I don't know if I traded it in or what. I got some money for it, but I ended up getting a Canon 60D and that was like my right on first uh, DSLR. But, but I'm also of the, like, I know I said I baby, I feel like I baby my FS7. Um, but like, I'm of the opinion that like you buy this gear to like use it. It's a and tool. Like, it is, it is a tool. Yeah. It's, it's a tool. And, um, I mean, I baby those new, the new cinema lenses that we got, but that's because they're worth about as much as a car. Yeah. yeah but, um, gosh, yeah. <laughs> but the camera, I like, I, you know, I'm okay with it be, you know, getting scratched and, you know, like you gotta be whatever it takes to kind of get the shot. Like I'm, I'm okay with it. Like it's, it's, it's a tool and I'm, I'm, you know you know, I'll, I'll deal with it after the shoot, you know, like <laughs> up to a point, totally, you know, up to a point. I think <laughs> totally. I love the mindset of it being a tool. Um, we're definitely like, we will, we will put the cameras in, in compromising positions, but it's only now after years of, of doing stupid stuff with the cameras, it's only, I'll only put it in compromising spots. If I've double, triple checked that I trust that mm-hmm. spot. Um, yeah. you're talking about, you know, the wind blowing your camera over and you see a, seeing a big hole in the bottom of your camera. Um, when it was in a, like a, it, you had it on a tripod, it was in a trusty spot. Um, we pack our, oh, hello. I haven't been able to see you. Oh, in a while. Hey. Oh, um, hey. We put, I, I've been packing the FS7 inside a, a Pelican case since I bought the thing. Um, Mm -hmm. because I wanted to make sure this was the, the biggest investment I've ever made into a camera before and the lenses. I bought two of the, two of the, the cinema lenses. So I pack them really neatly into this Pelican case, but I, I was, I was leaving the lens mounted to the camera because I was working on these documentary construction shoots. I was pulling the camera out and I had to be, I had to run once we got to, to the shoot location, I opened it up. I'd have batteries charged, pop one in, yep. cards already formatted, go. I don't want to have to do any setup because these commercial construction, they're not going to wait for anybody. They're not waiting. So yeah. I'm going to yep. get the phone call that, oh, by the way, we already started doing it. Do you want to, did you want to film it? We're halfway done. Can you? We're yeah. halfway done. <laughs> so I was leaving it all set up and I, and I showed up, I had my, my FJ cruiser all packed neatly. Like you were saying, you saw that picture. I have it all packed yep. neatly and everything's in a case. So I trust it. I went to grab one of the boxes out and the Pelican case with the camera in it fell out and it mm-hmm. landed on the ground. I was like, oh, good thing I keep my everything in Pelican cases. I cracked open the case and the camera's sitting there. The lens is detached. All of these wires are hanging out. I was like, oh no. Oh no, what have I done? The meta bones broke. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, just the meta bones broke. The lens yeah. was fine. The camera was fine. The, the mount. mount was fine. Everything was fine. The meta bones broke. And I was thankful that one, I had a, a meta bones on there, but two, thankful that the meta bones was cheap enough 
to just crack and it didn't stay put because m- maybe if the meta yeah. bones was was more solid it something else would have cracked but yeah. now yeah, like everything open. gets everything gets torn down there's a reason people ask like well why do you have to tear everything down why are you why do you have to set up isn't it tedious it is tedious but i have dropped this thing it's not that protected inside there you got to make yeah. sure that everything's broken down but you're right like it's a tool so once I've double, triple checked something, we've got photos on our Instagram of our camera in the weirdest places because we've, mm-hmm. I double checked it. I feel comfortable leaving it there. We flew down to yeah. to Patagonia with that. We bought this camera, bought all this new gear. First thing we did with it is take it down to the tip of South America and and put it through yeah i mean there are 40 mile an hour wind gusts we went out on these on these lakes in in rafts uh and i i was hell bent on getting shot the biggest brown trout the biggest brook trout the biggest rainbows were all out in the lakes and Mm -hmm. the wind gusts and 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 the i mean it looked like we were on the ocean it's a tiny little lake but with how crazy (laughs) the wind was we're on an ocean and we're in a tiny raft with just three guys mitch was like, well, what if we just don't film the lakes? Because he doesn't want me to take the camera out there. I'm like, no, 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 no. I am taking it. We're yeah. Th- these are the biggest fish. These shots have to be in whatever film we make. So mm-hmm. he gave me a waterproof um, roll top Patagonia bag to at least put the camera in. But I left it all set up because I was like, if we're if we're gonna get a fish on, I'm gonna open up the bag. I'm gonna take it out and flip it all on, and I'm gonna start filming. Yeah. I went, we haven't even gotten in the boat yet. And our fishing guide, who's this Argentine awesome dude, grabs the bag, doesn't, he? it's a fishing bag. He doesn't- Yeah, he doesn't know. He doesn't know yeah. that <laughs> all of our brand new gear's in there. He grabs it, <laughs> tosses it in the raft, and I- Your heart stops. My heart stops. <laughs> I pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> everything's fine on the camera except we keep the on the fs5 we keep the proprietary sony monitor on there so that we can see mm-hmm. settings because it, it, we can't yeah. see the settings on the whatever the little the mount for the proprietary monitor is broken the it's just laying in there in the bag yeah <sighs> at least it was yeah just, it's always it's never when you're actually shooting something breaks it's always like transport like yeah it's like yeah, I I have that problem with uh, when I fly the whenever we park the rental car, like the the guys that take you in the shuttle for the rental car will insist on like grabbing your bags and putting them in the shuttle, and they're just throwing them, and I'm like, no, nope. no, like I I can do it, like just give me because I have like you know I'm traveling with like six bags, I'm like no, just let me do it because like you're gonna like throw my crap into this shuttle thing and it's like yeah you know that's where the, that's where stuff ends up getting broken is like yeah it's when you're i don't want you know, them traveling. to handle my bag without gear like right I, I just, right yeah, yeah right. like i got a laptop in there i got all sorts of stuff yeah yeah i will say that the um i i broke the one of the pins in the mount of the fs7 um i flew i was flying back from san francisco not last year, year before that. And I got back, I don't know how it happened, but one of the pins, if you look inside your FS7 mount, and it's like a tiny, tiny pin, uh, the plastic around it was broken. And uh, it was causing the aperture on my photo lenses to like, it would, it would jump to like, all the way closed and then it would jump to like wide open and it was just it was jumping all over the place and uh, i couldn't figure out what in it was because when mount? i when you in the actual fs7 yeah in the lens mount the lens underneath mount. the sensor um and i if you looked at it with an with your naked eye i i couldn't see anything wrong and then i got really got like in there and i'm looking around and i just noticed that the plastic is broken on one of the one of the last pins and um so that mount the, the like the e-mount is great because you can adapt it to everything it's just not sturdy super solid um yeah which i guess they fixed with the mark ii fs7 mark ii they fixed a lot of things uh, with the mark ii the mark ii is the exact same camera it just has better quality yeah. certain yeah. little tiny things like that 
Yeah. I had a the Canon 100 to 400 millimeter lens, the the trombone. Um mm-hmm. I was I I went down to um I think we were in Cabo for um this series of seminars. I was I was filming the seminar. I was recording all the seminars. And um I finish up I I pop that lens on there. I filmed everything and then I go to tear down and I couldn't get the lens off. It wouldn't mm-hmm. wouldn't come off. So I I I really I was only there to film the seminar, so it was okay. I didn't need to change the lens. Really, I don't need to change the lens. So I left it. And then the only problem was I can't travel back with this. My whole, like the whole packing situation involves no lens being on here. So I, I spent most of my free time in Cabo for five days in my hotel room trying to figure out why this will come shaking off. shaking it, trying to... Shaking it. <laughs> yeah. And eventually I was able to put the camera um, face down, the lens face down, and I was able to shake it and get one of the screws on the mount, the the EF mount of the lens. One of the screws came out. It had just worked <laughs> its way out, but it it's like popping the it was lens. blocking the mechanism. Yeah, yeah, popping it on that one last time was just enough to get it to come all the way loose. And I, I thankfully I got it off. Oh my gosh! I did not put it back on the camera. I came back and I and I fiddled, fiddled with it back here, um, but it was so stressful, unbelievably stressful yeah. to be down in another country. Yeah. This happens. I've been down in 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 um, I can't remember where I was. San Diego. In, I was in San Diego for another same the same organization. I was filming a bunch of seminars. I didn't bring that lens, but I did. Um, we shoot. We have. We use the HDMI channel on our FS7 to the the small HD, because uh, right. um, yep. we we told you this. I think yes, yes. Yeah. We've explained this before. <laughs> the SDI input is broken, and I've ne- we've never gotten it fixed. But that means that if you change settings and then you change them back, suddenly the FS7 Sometimes. is not sending a signal HDMI to an external monitor, and you have to have the proprietary monitor. I wasn't flying with the proprietary monitor because it was just extra weight. Yep. Yep. But I had to find some <laughs> Instagram community, find someone who uses an FS7. I found someone around me. Um he was like 45 minutes outside of 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 San Diego. And he We um, should get him on the podcast. We will. He's yeah. um uh There you go. I think his name's Nick. He's Gumshoe Creative. Yeah, Gumshoe Creative, I think, yeah. Gumshoe Creative. He But I I called him. I got his voicemail. It was dinner time. I didn't think I was actually going to get it. And it's my, my number is a Washington state number. He's not going to answer that. Um, yeah. But I called, I left him a voicemail. I was like, Hey, I found you on Instagram. I'm a DP. I'm in California. I need an FS seven <laughs> monitor. And the story was so ob- obscure. <sighs> he called me back right away. He's like, Hey, sorry, I, I'm making dinner with my family. I might be able to leave and make it up your way, but I'm not sure Sure enough, 40 minutes later, he texted me. Uh, he was outside my hotel room, and he came in, oh my plugged God. the screen in. We fixed the settings. He unplugged it, and I was like, thank you so much, and I had to run in and keep shooting. Oh, my God. But Yeah, I never I never leave that monitor. I was on a shoot. Um, I think it was the shoot. I did a shoot with Buster Posey, uh, and we had like 30 minutes with him, and they wanted some shots of him some B-roll shots after we, uh, after we shot like an interview with him. And I remember I switched from, you know, 4k 30 or whatever it was to 1080 slow-mo and it was just black. And I was like, you know, he's, he's got like three minutes at this point. It was just black. And I'm like, I'm sweating right now. What I was like, what is going on? I'm like, what? Uh, And I didn't have the F7, stock them on it. It was just my, you know, small HD one on there. And I'm like, what is going on? And I'm like waiting and waiting and like, we can't wait any longer. So I'm like shooting like blind and nobody, nobody knows that I'm like shooting blind. I'm just just like getting shots. I'm just getting shots blind. I mean, at this point he's got three minutes like, and, um, (laughs) and and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden it came up and I was like, what that? So I never leave that monitor I, it, it comes with me everywhere. Mitch, I never put it on the camera. Mitch is but, gonna 
that, that <laughs> Mitch is gonna remember this story for forever. That monitor is gonna be like uh, like attached <laughs> to the camera from now on because we don't want to run into that problem. Yeah, it's uh, we shot something yeah. for Art List uh, a little while ago, and they needed twenty five frames per second. They're in the UK, and we flipped it out. Uh, we flipped it to twenty five FPS, and then and then um, we had to shoot the next day. And I told mm-hmm. Mitch, hey, I'll I'll flip it back. I, I I mentioned that I would flip it back and I mentioned the monitor thing. I was like, I'll fix it before we get to the shoot the next day. Um, mm-hmm. I wasn't able to make it to the shoot next day. Mitch had to go do it by himself. He's Uh-oh. he's there. Which is fine. I've done this. It's, it's You've done it's this just, before. <laughs> this is the first time we were in 25, what what is it? 25 in, in, frames per second. It's, it's uh, PAL instead PAL, of NTSC. In, in, instead of NTSC. And, yep. You called me, you FaceTime called me and you're like, okay, Sam. And I could hear the chaos behind him. There's the crowd of people. <laughs> he only has a short amount of time with these they, people. They had, they wanted a shot. I don't want to say it's super lame because they're a client of ours, but it's super lame. They wanted a shot <laughs> of like all 100 staff. And so and, you got 100 people waiting on you. For yeah. Like and there was change, also a photographer. A there's also a, a photographer on set to take the take photo pictures. Yeah. And he wants it a certain mm-hmm. way. And Mitch wants it a certain way. And so and Mitch's camera is not working. And now yep. he looks like an idiot in front of the, the photographer and in front of the client. And I, he gets on FaceTime and he's just looking at me like, just walk me through really quick. And we go through the settings really fast. The screen turns back on. He goes, "Okay, bye," and just hung up. <laughs> <laughs> we made it happen, Jeez. and we got the shot. Yeah, it's uh, you got the shot. Sh- it looked great. Yeah, it looked great. It worked out. <laughs> it worked out. Yeah. So yeah. It always works out. But yeah, those those moments are are stressful. You could have just shot blind. That would have worked, right? Yeah. That oh, is so yeah. unbelievable. There was any of that footage, the blind footage. Did it work? Ball? I think I used like one shot of of it. Like I just you're just kind of like cranking through focus. Just I'm like just like trying to find I'm, one spot where yeah. I was just literally I just I was because he was like literally about to leave and and I literally just hit record. It was just nothing was coming up on the screen. I just hit record and I was like, all right, I'm gonna just try to get a shot and um. You know the camera was still I don't know it was doing it was still you know switching modes and processing at the time, so nothing's coming up, nothing's coming up, and I'm like, oh my god! And they're like, are you rolling? And I'm like, yeah, I'm rolling. And like, you know, you're trying to you're trying to keep it cool, you know, like, and um, and, but you're sweating, which you're already sweating uh, oh, holding a god, camera. Oh god, I was dude. I and we're in the sun, like it was. Yeah, and it fine like after I don't know ten seconds of me just playing off that I'm shooting, you know. You're like pulling out your phone. You got like Filmic Pro going, (laughs) and you're like, "Yeah, we're rolling." (laughs) Trying Uh, to frame it up. Well, (laughs) yeah, it was. Yeah, that was that was bad. So I never leave anywhere. Yeah, without that. That's. I haven't had a problem with it ever since I went SDI. I was think I was going HDMI out of, and and ever since I switched over to. SDI, it's it hasn't. I've never we'll had to get a another problem with it. Or we, so. but I will tell you guys. Yeah, but then you're I will tell one. you guys the um, you know, my experience with Sony customer service because if you do get your SDI fixed, you'll have to go through them. So that broken pin that I had in the mount happened in December of uh, would have been 2017, and then uh. I was set to go to the Olympics in February of 2018. So I had roughly a month to get it fixed, which I thought would be plenty of time to have Sony fix one pin in the lens mount, not even diagnose any other, you know, they didn't have to figure out what was wrong with it. They just had to replace that piece. Right. So I literally bring it, I drive it to New Jersey, uh, to the, the Sony, uh, repair center and drop it off and like tell them like you know here's exactly what's wrong with it like blah 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 and the next three or four weeks were so stressful because i had already submitted the serial number of my camera for the you have to get the you have to get a um you have to submit it to the olympic 
this Olympic committee and, and say that you're bringing that camera. Oh my gosh. Because they check when you get there, they give you a, a camera sticker. That makes sense. And Probably for security so, reasons and stuff. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. And so I had already submitted the serial number, you know, of my FS7 for the Olympics. And so the next, you know, next I'm waiting and waiting. I, I, you call and you don't get anyone. You call the service center number and you get someone in like Texas. And then they try to forward you to someone at the service center. And I remember talking to someone and them being like, oh yeah, like it, it's, it's like scheduled to be looked at like this date. And then that date passed and like no one had looked at it. And I sent an email, it didn't get answered. And then finally, after I think it had to be like week three of them having it or at least a month in, I was like, I wrote an email and I was like, listen, like I have submitted the serial number. I leave February 2nd, you know, th which is in like 10 days or something like that. And I was like, I have to bring this camera. Like I can't, I already like the deadlines passed to switch, you know, the serial number. Like I have to bring this exact camera why is it not fixed? Yeah. <laughs> like what is going on? You know? And basically I finally got an email back and they're like, Oh, it'll be done this date. Like, like two or three days. And it got in, it got done finally. And I went, picked it up and like had it with like, I don't know, three, four days to spare before we, we left for the Olympics. But I almost, it was so, it was, that was stressful. That was an it was... epic thriller right there. <laughs> but yeah, Sony, so Sony customer service, I will say Canon customer service, awesome. Really? Sony customer service, not great well, so far. Oh, that is awful. Luckily, we don't have to take the, we don't have to send the FS7 in because it's, it the, is, small it's HD the small monitor. HD monitor. Oh, it's on the small HD. Yeah. Okay, well, I, you guys are good. You're good then. And they they the times I've called have been pretty yeah pretty solid. They I actually were, yeah. called about the Focus Bolt mm -hmm. 500 RX, um, the that um, focus monitor, the director's monitor. Oh yeah, I called before we bought it. Yeah, before we bought it, because every photo. Oh, camera, hold on, hold on, hold on. My camera's gonna run on a card. Hold no on. Oh no, we have been recording for a long time. <laughs> By the way. My toddler, you know our fancy coffee table that picks up and it's like a desk. Yeah. It has like little springs in it. Yeah. Shayla was on the phone for two seconds, looks away, turns around, and he's has picked it up, shoved his hand under there, and slammed it shut. She watched him do it. <laughs> and his knuckles are black and blue. All right, we're good. So you were saying the small HD. Yeah, so I, I called and I want to say they're out of South Carolina. I can't yeah, remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I call, get on the phone with uh, sales. And because we were concerned, if you look at the, uh, the photos uh, of the photos, bolts. they, they have handles on this both sides. Yes. Every single photo in, and we watched the videos of them at, um, I don't think it was NAB. One of, one of those con conferences Every single video or review we saw, the, the, handles, the handles are stuck on the monitor. And we knew all along that we want to add the Tilta uh, Nucleus M system yep. to to the monitor. We want to be able to take the handles off. And take the handles off. There's another model of, of screen that they have, wireless monitor system. It's like $4,000. They show the photo. Yeah, 703. Yeah. yeah, they show a photo of it without the handles on. So we're assuming that it's intentional. The bolt handles don't come off yeah we're thinking that oh they made it so handles are removable on the more expensive one but not on <laughs> anyways so i call and the sales guy goes oh yeah the handles come off and i go really uh because uh every every photo online and even what we watched online he's like you mean on the website it doesn't show it without handles a photo and i go without the handle <laughs> yeah yeah without and I, and I go no he goes really and he pulls it up he goes i'm gonna go talk to marketing right now <laughs> and he walks <laughs> with me on the phone <laughs> and then he's like i'm talking to him telling him like my interest in the product and all this stuff and then he's like hey guys i'm on the phone with somebody and he's like talking to marketing while i'm on the phone telling them uh... to get pictures of the 
product without the handles. And I was so like, okay, small was, HD customer service yeah. is pretty rad. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Inland Film Co. for, yeah, uh, you know, finding out that there's no handles, you know, and, and yes. getting small HD to change the website. <laughs> yeah, I still I need to check if they updated that. We but should check. Yeah. So for anybody that's looking at that, yeah, monitor. I want to say um, they did handed. because I was looking at it. I was looking at it a few nights ago. I was looking at wireless different. The 703 oh, and the, the focus. And I want to say that there was a shot of it without the handles on there. Good. I think. So I've been yeah. on the other side of that one that the I was the marketing person that the sales guy came and talked to at um we do we do some videos for a a, a data center manufacturing company here in town. They were telect for thirty five years. They recently changed their name to Amphenol Network Solutions. That doesn't matter. It's just a fun side fact. But <laughs> I one of my, my very first official job, I got hired to do product videos and product photos was for this local data center product manufacturing company. And I've had sales guys walk up to me while on the phone and say, we don't have a photo of this product with the card taken out <laughs> on the website. So this guy's calling me asking, does the card come out? And so I literally was handed the product. I went and I went to the white background, took the photo, photoshopped it, <laughs> Put it and in. we uploaded it that day. <laughs> this is so funny that I love that they did that. Totally. Been on both sides, we, yeah. uh, we routed a, an SDI cable really neatly on our FS7. Um, we have a, uh, the shape, um, top the cheese plate yep. that goes around yep. the stock handle. Yep. And I routed an SDI cable. It was the perfect length. I think it's like a foot and a half. And it goes from the back through, but I had to screw, I routed the cable and I had to screw the cheese plate on top. So the SDI cable doesn't come out. Uh, huh. And then and then it went up to the small HD monitor. And I handed, it was the, I, I, we, before Mitch started, before Mitch and I joined forces, I had a, a first AC that I would run with a lot. Mm -hmm. And I had this guy go shoot, uh, um, go shoot a, a construction piece for me with the, I, I wasn't able to be there. So I handed him the whole system. He knew how to use the camera. He went out, took the camera and shot some stuff, came back and he goes, by the way, the SDI cable didn't really work very well. Something was wrong. <laughs> and I look at the back of it and I had routed just enough cable to get the monitor in, in the spot where I always used it, but I had yeah. never moved it from that spot. Yeah. He took the, the arm and, and it. moved it around and the SDI mount on the back of the small HD was just like hanging, dangling, hanging, <laughs> dangling. He had to really, he must have been like, why won't it move? Oh I I never told him that he broke it. I just thought I'm an idiot for routing just a tiny cable. And I never explained that and I'll get it fixed one of these days. I, I think I, I think I, if I remember correctly, I think that though people, a lot of people were having that problem and a lot of people were mad because those SDI connectors are like soldered onto like the board right there or really? something. And yeah. And so a lot of people have had that problem, um, is what I've heard. Uh, well, I can tell you, I don't like running HDMI into that thing. And, and now that we have the, the FS five, we run SDI into the, um, the Atomos, and I wish we were just running it SDI into the mm -hmm. small HD on this other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, I never have a problem switching between modes. It always, for some reason, whatever whatever I have selected in that output menu, it's always it's always sending an SDI signal, which is yeah, it, key. it's it's definitely there's there there are advantages. To running SDI on the on the FS7, yeah. um, and I know in the menus, if I have to go back and, and reselect HDMI um, 1080, it's obvious that SDI the the menu system for SDI is established. HDMI is going to change. Yeah, it's, yep, yeah, yeah. I don't know why it does that. <laughs> so, all right, this is officially. Um, Zach Trinka podcast part two because we've gone a, like so this is awesome we've gone so <laughs> long into this and it, and it doesn't feel like we've been going that long um, well it, it's cool because this is our first this is our conversation first where is. we're yeah. actually speaking words um, yeah orally and yeah not, not typing. typing them yeah so um, except for that one time that I sent a video about we, we talked to you about the Ronin how do I 
how do we power oh, yeah. something off the Ronin? And I found the little D tap. Yep, that's right. Cable underneath, underneath. And I sent you a little Instagram video. That's right. Yeah, that was. And the I best will be way honest. Explain it. I sent. Uh, I I recorded three different videos <laughs> on my phone because the first one. Uh, I stumbled over my words and I got embarrassed because I've never <laughs> I've never talked to Zach, so <laughs> I got nervous. Zach Take and I one. have been pen pals for so long. I've never <laughs> actually sent him real <laughs> words, so I don't want to sound like an idiot. But then <laughs> the second video, I, I didn't realize Instagram messages will only let you send 60 seconds. And I talked for like two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you sent me a you sent me a full on video. Two I minute, did. So I two, had to record a third movie. one. I had to record a third one and I went so fast. Here's the D tap. Say hi to Mitch. Send At first it. I was like, what? I don't know what he's talking about. And then I was like, oh, yeah. Isn't it underneath the thing? Like, isn't it right there? Like, <laughs> I don't know. That's where it was when I used it. But well, the, yeah. whoever you, you, whoever you were renting it from or using it with, they had already installed it. Yep. That and you little guys D tap thing. Yeah. Yeah. That D tap thing comes in a little in the little bag of extra cables. That was when we were trying to f power the nucleus. Yeah. Yeah, and we were running it up top. Yeah, we yeah. ran the power cable, just dangled it up to the so top janky. handle. Oh, it was so janky. So disgusting. And we were like, there's no way. I'm so ashamed. There's no way. <laughs> you should, I mean, especially with how well, like, integrated that system is. The, yeah. The Ronin, like, all of the cabling, all, everything is just dialed. And then to have this one cable that's just like, yeah, it's disgusting. Oh, it made me sick. <laughs> we got to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, but assuming you're you're dating someone now, right? I am. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when yeah. you get married, you hire my wife as your wedding photographer, and then I'll just come along, and then Sam yeah. can DP your wedding, and yeah. then I'll. Yeah. That <laughs> You know what? I'll come. I'll come just, do the. I'll offer right now. Inland Film Co. will have one wedding film on their website, and that was Zach Trinka's wedding. No. <laughs> no. You know, I've never, I've fun. never thought about who I wanted to shoot my wedding, but if you guys want to do it, that would be, you know, that would be great. I would be honored. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about my wife has a wedding in Orlando this year, one in New Orleans. And then, so those are the fur furthest east, I think that yeah that she's going. But I was like, yeah. man, when is she going to get one in New York or Connecticut? You know, yeah, man. And you want me to? I'll start, I'll you start right now. Promote, I'll start promoting. Uh, you know, try to get you guys. Try to get your wife out here. If you guys, yeah. Are, you know, my my uh, my wife's never been to New York, so oh wow, I'm like, you know, she yeah. she's just, she's not a huge fan of like big big city stuff because she. She likes to shop, but not that much. I'm like, there's yeah. so much more to do, you know? You know, we can go, we can go to I'm Broadway. Not a, I'm not a fan of big cities. Yeah. But that's it's, just, it's, but you gotta it's in my DNA. You got to experience it like once. Like you got to, because there's yeah. nothing else like, you know, there's nothing else like New York City. It is true. There's nothing like it. And in terms of like just food, I mean, you can stop anywhere and find something different, something awesome. Yeah. You know, and yeah, it's pretty awesome. I, I, think it's I do cool. want to go to New York. My Have you wife, never been to New York City? I've never been to New York. My I like didn't even. My wife, your sister, has been to New York and and tells me all the time. Well, we'll it'll come up in conversation. Oh man, we gotta go to New York. I need to take you to New York. She says that over and over again. Hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, man. So, come 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 out. Come visit. I'll. I'll uh, I'm not like so. I'm. What's convenient about where I am is in Stan in Stanford, Connecticut. I can walk out my door, uh, walk about three minutes down to the train station, jump on the train, and be in Grand Central in Midtown in fifty minutes to an hour. Right on. Coming from upstate Central New York, I remember the first time I moved down here, and like the commuting culture was such a shock to me like people wait people take trains like but now i'm so used to just being able to jump on the train and, and get into the city and um last week i was actually i had to drive in and park um in in midtown and uh i parked 
right near Times Square. And so I'm like walking through Times Square and like, you know, everyone, all the tourists are there and it's, you know, you're just, you're walking, you're walking around and you're like, like people come from all over the world to like, just be here in Times Square, you know? Yeah. Um, and here I am just walking to work, like do to do, like, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's wild. It's, it's, um, definitely something that everyone has to kind of come and experience and, and, but I have no desire to like move into the city. Um, yeah. you know, I love being out, out here in Connecticut and having a car. Um, yeah. so it's, it takes a, takes a special kind of person to, to want to live in the city. I've got some friends that live in the city and, and, uh, I think they're crazy, but <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. uh, so do you have to, do you lug your cart onto the train? That's what I was going to ask. Oh man. I, I, I did once I took my lights. I w- once I took too much stuff and, um, <laughs> of course it was a day that uh, I had to switch trains. Like I had to uh, do a connection. So like I had to get on the train with it and then, uh, get off and then get on another train to get into the city. And of course it's like snowing that day and like wet and like, um, I miss, I didn't know where New York city. I'll say this production in New York city logistically is an absolute nightmare. Like no place in New York City is is accessible, like accessible friendly. Like there's no ramps anywhere. Like finding the elevators is, you know, a pain. So I ended up missing my connection train because I couldn't find the elevator in the train station. Um, and so that was the last time I ever bring like too much stuff. If I if I have like a backpack and like one case or something, like I'll I'll train it in, but if I got to bring stands and like stuff like that in, it's I'm, I'm driving in every time. And, um, I'm so glad you asked that question. Yeah. Cause the, the, the image of you lugging all that stuff on a train is so funny. Oh I just man. Got it in my mind right now. Yeah. Do it's, you, do you, yeah. sorry, keep going. No, no, it's, it's just, it's just, it's, um, I always tell people like, I, I, I'm not a professional cinematographer. I'm a professional mover. Like, you know, when you show up with all that gear, it's just like, it feels like you're just always loading in or loading out. Like you're, and you're doing it all by yourself in your scenario. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's just me or, you know, it's sometimes it's me and, you know, two people. Um, but you know, every elevator you get in, in New York city is like way too small. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's a different beast. (laughs) <laughs> one of the one of the agencies that hires us all the time is a good friend of ours, Dane, um, Victory Media. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's just look over here to the. He'll love that. Uh, no, he's 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 big into CrossFit, and he's got these. He's he's got these muscles, and he wears his his tight polo shirts. And <laughs> we show up we show up one time, and we texted him and said, "Hey, can you come down and help us bring the gear up?" He runs downstairs pulls we have one of the big long pelican cases full of light stands and all this heavy stuff he grabs the side handle i don't even i didn't know there was a side handle on this thing i only know of there's a side handle on this thing because it's got wheels on it i would never pick it up he grabbed the side handle picked it up and starts carrying it upstairs and i'm like hey dane there's wheels on that oh just kept walking just kept walking (laughs) and it's got professional movers now that you just reminded me, I, that exact case, it's the, it's the, like the gun case, right? Like the, yeah. So I, one time I had to bring stands. I had brought stands in. I think I had drove stands in and then I needed to bring them back home. And I, I was at Fox that day and, uh, I had taken the train in and so it's like, oh yeah, I'll just take the one case. I'll just take it on the train. Like it's, you know, whatever. Well, it had like three or four stands in it. And so I'm walking like three blocks to Grand Central and I'm lugging this like gun case thing and it weighs like, you know, 40 pounds and I'm stopping. I'm like catching my breath then I'm going 
and like I had to have someone like help me carry it like down the stairs and like it was it was a mess and like then you get on the train and everyone's like what is this what, what's this guy doing like what's this guy yeah, doing? yeah. yeah you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's the gun case and it's in and, and on the train it's like <laughs> you know it's like it's all these you know business people that commute you know they're they're yeah you know especially at like rush hour and uh it's like get on with this big massive like case you know and like and now you're inconveniencing them yeah yeah i'm sweating i'm literally like sweating you know and like (laughs) (laughs) i look like i just like ran a marathon and like you know jumping on the train yeah Uh, it's it's crazy production the the airports taking all of our gear down to patagonia i had a giant uh we got the shimoda backpack it's it's huge. I've got all my camera stuff in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I have, um, I have my, uh, a big case that I'm flying with, with all of my, my carry on with all of our batteries and chargers and stuff. So I have both of these and we have to get on, on a couple of the connecting flights. We had to get on a bus to get out to the tarmac and we get on the bus and we crammed so many people in there. And I stood next to a guy and I, and I apologized to him right away. The bus is already crammed. I got on and I said, sorry, I'm I'm going to have to cram next to you. And I've got my huge pack and this. <laughs> and then this person wanted to walk by me. And so I kind of tried to turn and I, and I mm. swung the backpack just a little too far and I hit the guy. And he was visibly irritated with me as a person, all the stuff. Why am I traveling with all this stuff? And I was like, yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. And he's like, watch it with that backpack. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Oh gosh. I know. I always like part of me always like when I travel, I always have my think tank roller, uh, with usually like the camera in it. And then, uh, my peak designs travel bag has like all of my batteries and like the lenses and stuff in it. And so it ends up being a lot. And I'm always, I always feel bad, like getting on a plane with both of them and trying to like put them both above you know, but then I'm like, all these other people are carrying like clothes and like, you know, it's like just normal stuff. Like I have two yes. cars in this, in both of my life is in both of these bags. Like my life yeah. is in both of these bags. Like, you know, so it's like, it's, it's, it, I'm just like, can I, can I please just like put them both above please? Right. Like, right. <laughs> and then there's sometimes when they'll ask you over the intercom as you're boarding, Hey, we've got a full flight today. If you are willing yeah. to check your bag, just let us know. We'd love, yeah. we need 20 people, yeah. need 20 people and nobody's going to do it. Because yeah. nobody wants to be the person, but then yeah. they say, "And please remove all batteries before. Please remove all lithium batteries before." And I'm thinking, yeah. okay, so I'm out. Yeah, I can't. I'm not going to sit here and remove all the batteries from. These oh, batteries. I've had them. I've had them do that to me. I've had them. I've oh. gotten up there with the roller, and they've been like, "Oh, we need, we got to check that." And I'm just like, "Hey, listen." Like I explain, you know, like I'm, I'm traveling for work. Like I'm a cinematographer. I have replacement lithium ion batteries in here that are not supposed to be checked. And I literally had one guy that was just like, I was like, is there any way I can just not check it? Like carry it on. And he's like, well, how bad do you want to piss off the flight attendants? And I was like, oh geez. I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm pulling all these batteries out of here. Like, so so now I put all my batteries in my backpack and if they make me check the think tank roller, it locks. It's at least swallowable. Yeah, it locks. Yeah. It has the camera in it. I'm not I'm not super upset about it, but at least I don't have to swap the batteries out, you know? Yeah. Um, which is just a pain. <laughs> um but we yeah. uh going so flying with all of this gear, I had one check bag that was full of um, V mount batteries, a, a battery charger. Um, we threw, we just have a Mavic, the first Mavic Pro, uh, that with a controller and a bunch of batteries and the battery chargers. Um, all this, all of the like converters for we were going to be in in Argentina, so we needed some converters with all this stuff. We have all this stuff all packed in here, nice and neat. Um, our local airport in Spokane is pretty small and yeah. going through TSA there. Hey, it's an international airport. It's an international <laughs> airport. We, we fly to it's Canada. International. Interna- we fly to Canada. <laughs> it is literally well, called Spokane like, International. <laughs> there's, they were super nice about all the stuff. I, I have, um, 
my experience flying, I, I started flying when I was 18 uh, for work. So I was, I, I've never flown without all my camera gear. So yep. I just assume TSA is gonna wanna look through everything because yep. it all looks weird. Here in Spokane, they opened it up. They just wanted to swab all of it. Yep. I had a nice conversation. It was very pleasant. They closed it up and I went on my way. But at a bigger airport, they wanted to open it up. They were nervous, looking at everything. <laughs> then our flight out of Argentina, security was so worried about oh, really? everything. It was ah. so funny. No, and, and they spoke very little English. They yeah. were all massively built, scary security guards. And they're looking at all the stuff and they're looking at me and they're pointing at this, <laughs> asking me what this is. And I'm trying to explain to them somehow. They, they are not understanding me. I'm not understanding them. Finally, a young security officer walks over and he looks in it and he's, I could tell in broken up English, he asks, is this a drone? Drone. <laughs> yes. Drone. And I said, yes. And then he goes, he points at every other thing in the bag and he said, is this for drone? Yeah. And I just, I started to pick up on, yes. just answer yes. I just started yes. answering yes. <laughs> Everything in the bag is for a drone. And he said, good. And he zipped it up and he sent it on the way. Perfect. Oh my God. Also, the funny thing about that experience for me was, I don't think we talked, I don't think I've mentioned this to you, is that, they in in the US you can't touch anything you know if you're going through yes. security at TSA yep. they you can point to things but they have to pull it out yeah and so if if they're trying to find something you can't like try to help right. them there but in Argentina it was the opposite like they, they, were, they Sam would like, tell just... her to like pick something up she's like no 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 like they couldn't touch anything they needed Sam hmm. to be pulling out and the craziest part to me about that one, me, them needing me to pull stuff out, because that's hilarious that you've noticed that that detail. Um, in Argentina, they wanted me to go through my entire backpack, and I thought, I don't have anything in my backpack that should make you nervous. And they pulled up, they held up a piece of paper that had things that you're not supposed to have on a, on the flight, and they pointed at a at a at a Leatherman, and they said, you have one of these in there, and I said, no, uh... I don't. Wait. I flew all the way down here. That was in Eskel. That was the that the, was in Eskel. the smallest airport I've ever been in. Maybe they pointed at the leather, the picture of the Leatherman, and said, "You have this in there." And I said, "No, I don't." And I argued with them a little bit, but I was mm -hmm. like, "Fine, we'll go through the whole bag. I'm fine. We'll go through the whole bag. Go through the whole bag." Sure enough, buried way deep. <laughs> My you, nice. You almost got thrown in jail, man. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, I flew all the way down there, and no, Nobody said no TSA in in the yeah. U.S. found that thing. Yeah, I think I think somebody in a scale like finding a a multi tool like that, a Leatherman, probably is difficult. So that whoever that was is like, oh, I need one of those. It's let's mine. Uh, let's. Uh, <laughs> it just like it. But it, I don't know how you know you're going through TSA, and I'm like, I mean, sometimes I get stopped, sometimes I. I don't. It's theater. It makes though. you worry it makes a little all, bit. It makes us all feel better. We don't, I yeah. don't really want to get into this one. This will take it to another hour if you want to get into TSA being security theater. Um, oh. I will the say, of, did, of you guys, tools did you guys, uh, is, is Argentina, um, you guys didn't have to do a, a carne, right? Do you know about the, the carne process like for your equipment? Oh no, we didn't have to do any of that. We, um, you, you kind of just banked on, yeah. Yeah, and 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 the we were going down. We were not it, technically. It wasn't a job. It wasn't a hired. Right. Job, it wasn't a yeah. hired thing. Um, yeah. We were going on a personal fishing trip with a group yeah. of guys, and and we were making it into. We're gonna we're gonna make a film out of it for our own personal use. Yeah. But we you know we made some connections down there that we'll we have a whole other podcast episode we want to dedicate to talking about. Mm. Yeah, making a film, a, a fly fishing film in Patagonia. Yeah, um, we we have we have made some cool relationships that, you know, this is a great example of like a portfolio piece. Um, we didn't really know what we were going to do. We yeah. had the opportunity to go on this fly fishing trip. We thought, let's bring all of our gear. Let's let's film a ton. Let's see what we can make. Mm -hmm. We ended up meeting some people who um, either work for you know, Patagonia, the brand, or we met some people at the, at the fly fishing lodge. We've met some other fly shop owners. We, and, and we, we've made some great connections and we think, okay, 
It's good that we brought all the camera gear. It's just a personal project, but this could be a portfolio piece that that gets mm -hmm. us in the door. Yeah. With, yeah. 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 It gets your foot in the door with with one of these bigger brands, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we didn't we didn't have to. Uh, I I was worried about that though, bringing all this gear down, because um, I didn't research. You know, are we supposed to yeah. file something? Do we have to have permits or what? Um, I was kind of nervous about things being confiscated. Um, I do follow. I follow Peter McKinnon on YouTube just because he's got some sweet stuff yeah. every once in a while, and and um, he talked about in Dubai. He flew into Dubai with a couple other filmmakers, and they all all their bags they go through. They all get through security, but he was stopped and his. They removed his drone. They removed his little mm. Mavic because um, of some weird reason. But all the other people he was flying with also had the same Mavic in their backpack. And why was theirs not confiscated? That's so huh. he did a whole video on it and that was right before we were about to leave and I was super worried that they were gonna confiscate the drone when we got into Argentina and they didn't ask about anything. Yeah. They didn't say anything. Yeah. Huh. Sometimes you have to fill out a carnet. Yeah. It's, it's this convoluted process and nobody Every time knows he says you have to get hungry. Yeah. <laughs> carne asada carne yeah yeah there you go <laughs> sorry you were saying though you've heard what i've heard it's just it's it's uh it's a process because you have to go and get it stamped at the airport before you leave you have to find the carne office and they go through all of your equipment get it stamped and then you have to get it stamped before you leave here and then before you leave there and it's I don't know. It's I've heard it's a process. I luckily have huh. not had to deal with it. So, um, no. I'm but I, I will about say, the next trip we go on. If you guys, uh, well, you guys don't really fly a lot with your gear, right? You're mostly mostly you are, regional, but yeah, we we so, we fly with it a decent amount a few times a year. I don't know if you saw. I posted that my media pass that I made. Uh, that yes, allows yes. you to. Yeah, here, where is it? Here, come on. Okay, I've heard of this. With TSA, right? With TSA. So this thing has been awesome. Yes. So I had seen that some photographers were making their own media passes and using them to get the media rate on flights. And I had put it off for a while uh you know Look making one Look at the back of that <laughs> yeah yeah can you see awesome so it just has like what whatever the policy is on there um and you can find that on no so i literally no oh. he just made that i just designed no, but this. i'm talking about the yeah media oh, the, policies. The, the, all, yeah you can find it on their website yeah you can find the media policy policies on on all of their websites but um so far i've traveled with it uh all this year and uh you know, everywhere I've gone, every I always say, "Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, fly, uh, media flying," and they see the the cases, the Pelican cases, and everything, and they're always like, "Oh, do you have do you have a media pass?" And I'm just, you know, I hand this over to them, flash this, they like immediately as soon as they see media, like they don't even they don't even look at it, like it's um, it's been awesome. So then you get your your media rate. So like, uh. For example, with Delta, uh, with Delta, your first bag is thirty dollars. Your second bag is forty dollars. If either of those bags are overweight, it's flat rate fifty dollars. If you have more than two bags, it's flat rate fifty dollars for the next like twenty three bags or something like that. Um, and so, I mean, you save. I mean, you save. That's a ton. amazing. Yeah on I, you know i just watched something on this recently yeah. and i i thought i thought it was funny that you you literally just make a pass that says media on it with your picture and yeah it, and it just has to seem official i have like a badge number on the bottom of it like you all, do yeah yes. <laughs> heck yeah, yes. heck yeah. <laughs> it's like just some made up like you know Sweet number or whatever we'll making one of those <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna make these yeah we gotta have me gonna make passes. this design uh yeah, I've been telling I've been telling everyone. I'm like, dude, just make them for you know, because you never know when when you're gonna travel. Because I've tried to use like my business card. I tried to use my business card once, 
and they didn't accept that. I tried to use, um, I have a Fox News badge uh, that gets me like into the building. I tried to use that and they were pretty skeptical. I think they let me, I think they let me do it that time, but they were like, this is like, we shouldn't be letting you use this. Um, and now ever since I've gotten this, like it's just, I love smooth, it. so smooth. Like we need media badges. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. We uh, we we did have to. Uh, cl- you're supposed to claim if you have over ten thousand dollars worth of <laughs> gear or something like that, or, or or of of goods. Yep. On the way down, <clears throat> and I obviously did not fill that part <laughs> out. And um, turns out like going into Argentina, going through customs, they don't even like look at that little piece of paper. Like no, they, they just don't. sat there and then the guy like hands their stuff back. He like did not even look at it. So I was like, okay, well, uh, yeah, let's ask, uh, like DPs, like who do you, uh, who do you look up to aspire to be like, um, and then, um, obviously mm-hmm. your own version. Um, mm-hmm. and then maybe favorite films or, TV shows. TV shows that you're you're into at the moment. Oh, I, I got one we can talk about. You guys know. You guys know which one. Homecoming. I'm trying. Oh, yes. Homecoming. 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 I'm sorry. Did you say Mr. Robot? Oh, <laughs> wait. No, you said Homecoming. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Was it, so D- did DP. you recommend Mr. Robot to me because of Homecoming? Yes. Or some, you did. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, you, you should not have done that because it's... Oh, you hadn't it, seen it? I thought you had seen it. You one, seen I'd never seen it. And I had two, seen Mr. Robot. On my way down to, to Argentina, I watched two whole seasons of Mr. Robot, and, and Mitch is so tired of me bringing it up all <laughs> the time. I am so into Sam. Is it Esmail? Esmail. Yeah. I am yep. so into this guy now. It's mm-hmm. amazing. So thank you. Let's talk about Homecoming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Todd Campbell, I think, right? Is I think yeah. is the DP. The DP. Um, ah, man, I just uh, that that show. Um, the the square aspect ratio to like. To 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 emulate this feeling of like her not remembering things, like ah, uh, like when I made that connection, I was like, really, like really, this is, uh and just, I mean, it's just so like, I think, I think the way that he, the way he frames stuff, uh, the way he composes his frames is kind of unlike, a, it's, it's kind of out there and it's kind of like, you kind of have to have a specific taste to like, like that yes. kind of style. And, um, I mean, I love that. I love, I don't know if I have really too many dps that i um i wouldn't say there's like one that i like really love um i i I like i tend to be drawn to um like dps that don't shy away from like darkness and Mm -hmm. um like gritty kind of feeling things and and less like perfect you know less than perfect frames um and i really appreciate good composition which is something that that todd campbell does so well in in homecoming um and in i in i robot mr robot um like where he frames people in like the bottom corner of the frame where you would never ever frame someone yeah Um, he does things to make you like you as a viewer feel s- certain emotions you or you get sick feel, yeah. watch looking at this framing yeah yeah and i don't know i think i think part of it with both homecoming and mr robot is um sam the director like his vision of the world that these people are in yeah uh, and, and like the art direction of like uh, the woman's office in in Homecoming, yep. like, and how there's so many scenes shot in this office. Yeah, every time we go in there, it's like still unique and like beautiful. And I mean, the whole thing takes place in this one pretty facility. much facility, you know, facility. And 
it's it always looks like unique like he'll the, like there there's there's shots where they're way up near the ceiling you know and they're shooting down this like hallway or whatever and um i don't know i just really i the story i i appreciated the story um i i but i i really want to watch it again because i think there were things visually that i didn't pick up on uh and so i think watching a few of the episodes again would be really interesting um and and uh yeah i mean yeah it just it looked looked stunning um yeah he does do they do pick strange framings a lot of them are are very symmetrical or or like symmetrical but with one thing that breaks the symmetry and so you you have to look at that one thing yeah um the other thing that I really enjoyed about Homecoming is, is all of the endings, the 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 long scenes yes. that yeah, just the led drawn into out, the like, yeah, yeah, they just led into the credits. Yeah, um, I, I think that one that one element of Sam Esmail's storytelling has has definitely impacted the way that Mitch and I are are, are seeing our commercial projects. <laughs> See, look, this is just awesome. Hey, this has gone good. so long. So we're, we're talking about Homecoming. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're talking about homecoming. Per- perfect timing. Perfect timing. We, we, we yeah, we watched yeah, it together. Good. It was Sorry. it was good. No, you're, you're hi, good. hi. <laughs> they say <laughs> Mitch and Sam say hi. Hello back. Do you want to wave? Wave to everyone. Wave to the internet. Hi. This is Lauren. Hi, hi Lauren. <laughs> oh, she can't. She can't hear though. Yeah, we're in the headphones. Yeah, she can't. She can't hear you guys. So you're good. Yeah, that's okay. We just totally yeah. test her out. She'll never know. Yeah. yeah. Um. No, the long takes. I think just letting things play out is something that I I am really it's it's made me think about cinema in a different way. Just letting something be. Yeah. And letting it play out that long, even if it's just going into the credits, but I am more inclined to um get fit long takes into our commercial projects just because of the, and, and, and pick strange framings. And I think one thing that I've noticed we're doing a lot lately is straight down shots yeah. um, mm. that play out for a long time. Or, um, you know, with, with the med spa, we're trying to, I'm trying to use the easy rig to get these like straight down and then just get, re, move the camera down and, and reframe to um, whoever's actually using the laser. And then, mm. and then, wait for them to say something interesting and just let that play out. And I think, um, you know, our, our structure for these commercial videos is, is less someone talking with B roll over top. And now it's, it's this being like immersed in, yeah, you're immersed in this. You, you see the, the action, you see the person, the reacting and you hear them say something and that, that leads into the dialogue. And it's so strange. And it's just because we're watching these, People like Sam Esmail and and yeah. and what's the what's the DP's name you were talking uh, about? Uh, Todd Campbell, pretty sure. Todd, Todd Campbell. Campbell. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. to your point about you know how the the sets are are set up for you know all sorts of beautiful images. That's I I've only watched first season of Mr. Robot. I'll watch the other two, but <clears throat> I have my things that held me back from jumping into second second season. <laughs> um, Homecoming uh, fell in love with right away. But what I noticed is he definitely had a larger budget, I feel like, going into Homecoming than yeah. Mr. Robot Yeah, with the set decoration. I mean, like, those were perfectly set up. You know, all, all of the element elements were thought out. And, yeah. you know, yeah. they were probably storyboarded. Oh, yeah. And it... It's just, There's it's, a... It's they did a... They did an article... Uh, ASC did an article on homecoming. I'll have to send it to you guys if you haven't seen it. But they yeah. they dove into like the set specifically and like how they how he lit it. And um, I mean, it was I mean the 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 lighting setup that they had for like the cafeteria area it was insane. Um, and then you know just the 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 one I think it's the first shot in the whole thing is like this long one take shot and I'm watching it and I'm like, is this like, is this all one shot? Like, is this all 
happening in in one shot and it's like yeah it is like just insane you know you know to to coordinate and like it it makes you appreciate you know at least it makes me appreciate like the you know the amount of planning that goes into something like that um Mm -hmm. and and it is cool to kind of take like like you're saying it's cool to take like elements of these like shows and bring them into the like content that you guys are making or, or I'm making like it's like whether it's like you're saying like longer takes or like I've tried to you know I've tried to make my content my branded content stuff look a little more like natural and a little more like gritty and and um rather than trying to like over light scenes um you know which i think comes from it comes from like watching shows like homecoming where they look very you know even though i know in the back of my head it's this you know million dollar budget thing and i know that they used lights and everything it's um the way that he the way that he can can kind of control and emulate natural light inside of buildings is something that i kind of take out and like try to implement in you know my stuff in the real world which is it's cool it's it's um it's inspiring uh definitely yeah oh yeah our uh you know to that point our our tagline for inland film co is cinematic marketing videos which for me at first was just kind of a placeholder because when we first started it was a placeholder just kind of describes it but over the years over the year and a half it's really taken form like it means something now because of this right here Mm -hmm. um we're not really inspired by other web branded content video makers we are but at the core we're inspired by these these beautiful narrative like these directors these dps that are you're like you're saying like Mm -hmm. the way they light stuff indoors um, and then we're going out and we're trying to, we're trying to emulate that or, or using that idea or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so cinematic marketing videos for me has, has really turned into, we're inspired by cinema. Mm-hmm. We're making yeah. marketing videos, but it's the way the, the, the things we're taking inspiration from are so much deeper than just marketing videos. Yeah. 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 It's, um, uh, it's cool. I love that. Like, um, uh, when I was, when I was only, um, still photography, it was, I, I wanted to get into commercial work and, um, um, oh my gosh, I had, the, I had her name in my mind, Victoria will. She's a commercial photographer. Um, she's done a lot of stuff for Carhartt and for Levi's and for all these, I watched a workshop with her where she was talking about lighting and you could see hands kept going up the live audience hands kept going up over and over and over again so wait that levi's branded shoot that's not that's not natural light (sighs) no no (laughs) and she'll be like wait hold on she'll pull up a photo and you can see there's 10 lights around like no this is it looks like natural light that's the point like i wanted Mm -hmm. it to look like a window but i needed the fade over here i needed the the highlight over here i needed all these things to look right so mm-hmm. this photo this brand this brand photo that looks like it was just a window yeah was 10 yeah. lights that she designed very meticulously and you're thinking oh my gosh how do you get to that point <laughs> i mean i would have just used the window but 10 lights maybe uh, i should be using 10 lights she i don't has know the budget for it for she sure has the budget for and it. the time i mean yeah. that part of that comes with they're gonna give her a full day to get right, that. and we're gonna have we're gonna have an hour, f- an hour <laughs> or five minutes with the guy to to grab a couple oh, shots. Yeah. Gosh, yeah, and yeah. your screen's not working. But it is funny. It is funny how it's like this. You start out like you start out using natural light and like shooting stuff because you don't have any lights or you don't know how to light, and then like you finally get lights. And you're, you know, now you're like, maybe you're like over lighting because you don't really know. And then, you know, you start watching Homecoming and you're like, oh, like, how did he do that? And you're looking at the behind the scenes and you're like, oh, well, he's just putting the light here instead of over here, you know? And it, and then, and so now you're, now you've come like full, full circle back to like, oh, natural light. And it's just like, it's, oh, it's just the light emulating 
you know, he's just emulating a natural light. That's that's uh, Mitch and I's mindset all the time. I love that. I really appreciate that. The the studio that we're in right now, um, we have huge. I mean, you can see one right here. You've got we've got these huge windows that go all the way around one side of the room. We do shoot some stuff in here. We shoot. Uh, we have a dark gray background or a white background, um, and we use the window light, and then we usually will take a daylight um, balanced one big old um, 1K with a soft box and we'll put it at a 45. We kind of, I just want to round out the light a little bit, but the the windows are already doing me, doing half the job. So a lot of the stuff that, that people have seen that uh, we've done in the studio, interviews we've done in the studio, it looks like we lit the whole thing, but it's usually just the windows with one thing to kind of enhance the roll off on the face. We've rented the studio out to uh, at least two different people now who have walked in and gone, what the hell do you do with these windows? <laughs> How do you black out the windows? We're like, no, we don't. They, they're they there. They're lights. They're there. <laughs> they are the lights. <laughs> but they look at the stuff on our website and they're like, well, how did you do this? The windows don't, just use them. That's the point. Mitch and I both met in, in music. Mm-hmm. Ah. I am, uh, I was, I was in, uh, I was a freshman in high school. Mitch was, was in co- was, you were. Freshman in college? Freshman no. in college. No, I would have been a sophomore in you college. You were a sophomore in college. And I was, uh, I wanted to play music at our church, but they, and, and Mitch was like the guy who would come back from college and play music at our church. <laughs> he was the cool guy. That's how Mitch and I met. Um, I did not know that he already had experience in the filmmaking world and I was also finding an interest in the filmmaking world, but we didn't start talking about that until, yeah. um, I was married to a sister <laughs> and then we started talking about films. Jeez. Well, and then I was like, have you seen this movie? Have you seen this? Movie? And Sam hadn't seen like any movie. <laughs> That's I hadn't not true. seen any movies. <laughs> just he hadn't seen the, the movies that I needed him you to You just see. started saying, well, if you want to be a filmmaker, you have to watch these movies. And <laughs> yeah. you gave me a stack of DVDs <laughs> and I started going through them. You, you let him marry you know? your sister before he had seen these movies? What are you doing? I know. What? I know. <laughs> I think had he watched There Will Be Blood before marrying my sister, he may never have gotten married. <laughs> Just <laughs> now, the first uh, I do remember this though. the The first um, I I asked Shayla before we started dating when it, when I was when I was I liked her and I was trying to we were, I was trying to convince her to go out on a date with me. I asked her what TV shows she's into, and the first thing she said was Sons of Anarchy. And so I was like, oh, well, the girl I likes like Sons of Anarchy, I'm going to go out and start watching it. And I don't, I had never watched any dark dramas. My family didn't really, my parents watched dark dramas, but they'd never share them with their, their two sons in high school. Yeah. So I went out and I started watching Sons of Anarchy and it, um, one opened my eyes to the world of dark dramas, but two was shocking that this is the kind of show my potential girlfriend likes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know i i am i'm constantly fascinated by you know mitch has this list of movies that i needed to watch um my now wife definitely comes from this family tree because um we were we we watch we have we have we have two kids we're watching kids shows um uh, somebody was telling us the story and my my wife and I and I said, ah, that reminds me of like the Frozen storyline, <laughs> and she looks at me and goes, um, I would say more like Lord of the Rings, and she starts explaining to me why it's more like the, the one of the storylines in Lord of the Rings, and I'm looking at her thinking, uh, you are Mitch's sister. This is amazing. <laughs> you are mad at me for going to Frozen for, for before I went to Lord of the for Rings, ref- yeah. referencing the wrong movie, according to her. Yeah, I'm referencing the wrong movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, the genes run strong. The storytelling genes run strong. There you go. That's where he gets it from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh well cool. Zach, I appreciate your uh time. We appreciate it. Yeah, your time. thank you so much. Yeah, guys. Thank you guys Good. for having me on and you know, 
always down to chat and uh it's uh it's crazy that we finally you know got to chat across the pond and i'm, I'm just yeah. glad uh instagram has allowed you know allowed relationships like this and allowed us to both learn from each other so thank you for listening to this podcast that should have released months ago special thanks to zach trinka zach we're really sorry for taking so long to put out part two it's nothing against you it's really us if you are interested in connecting with zach we listed his social media accounts in the description of this page and that's a wrap